Hello everyone, this is Malik and on behalf of Banyan Security and 451 Research, which is now part of S&P Global Market Intelligence, I would like to welcome you all and say thank you for attending today's virtual roundtable titled Boosting DevOps Productivity with Zero Trust Access. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen and we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. The presentation slides are available for download in the resource section in the console. And finally, the on-demand version of this event will be available after the live event concludes. Leading off today's discussion will be Fernando Montenegro, who is Principal Research Analyst at 451 Research. Joining Fernando is Tarun Desikan, who is COO and co-founder at Banyan Security. You can learn more about Fernando and Tarun by checking out their bios on your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Fernando to kick off this session. Hello, everyone. Uh, Fernando Montenegro here. Uh, I just want to double check. Uh, can people see me on the? Can, can people see the slides on the presentation, or is it just me that they're seeing? Okay. It is just you right now, Fernando. Okay. Malik, uh, can we make sure that the audience can see the slides? Yes, Fernando, they can see both uh, both uh, the windows. Okay, perfect, thank you. So again, uh, hello everyone, so Fernando Montenegro. I, as an analyst at the 451 uh, Research, now part of SNP, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and be talking to you. Uh, the way that we've structured the, the, this content, we're going to talk about as it says, boosting DevOps with uh, with secure access, and one of the one of the topics that the, the contribution I want to bring to this is what are we seeing in terms of trends in cloud transformation, in DevOps, and in security for DevOps that I think are relevant for this audience. Now, one of the things that uh, I, we always want to position is what is the what it, how are we doing what we're doing and. Uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about our methodology. What we do, uh, I like to present uh, lots of data and then help you as an audience organize where that data fits into your, um, into your, uh, where are you on your journey for that. And, the, and that data comes from two major sources. On one hand, we have the, uh, the hundreds or thousands of hours of briefings that we have with end user organizations, with vendors, with finance professionals, and many others, right? Under, trying to understand the, 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 the trends on the market. On the other, we have the 451 Voice of the Enterprise uh, survey program. Some of you in the audience may actually be part of it, and so for that, thank you. Uh, which is a, a, regular pro, a regular survey program that runs uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a cadence where we ask IT and security practitioners questions related to um, uh, to different areas that they may be interested in. So one quarter, we may ask questions about their budget for next year. Then the next quarter, we ask them, okay, what kind of projects are you planning to run this year? After that, we'll ask, how is your organization structured and how are you doing things? And then at the tail end, uh, then the, the, the last one would be how you, you've done an implementation, what's happening with your vendors um, how do you feel about that and so on? And then we go to budgets for next year. And what I think is interesting and relevant here is that a lot of the content is not only from our security surveys, but also from our broader cloud transformation and DevOps surveys. With that in mind, I, uh, I just want to position the agenda. So what we'll do is we'll talk briefly on, I like to do this at, at the high level, what are we seeing in terms of cloud enterprise adoption trends? which then affect to a large extent what we see on DevOps technology trends and then DevOps security. And then we can have a conversation along the way and Tarun and I will uh, will be going back and forth on a couple of topics uh, within each of those sections. Without further ado, let me get started with the um, high level cloud enterprise trends. <coughs> Sorry. Now, what we're seeing here is, again, lots of survey data, lots of, uh, um, Lots of uh, slides for us to uh, to go through. We asked practitioners, uh, uh, general IT practitioners, how are you going to modernize your applications? Many of us are involved in digital transformation and modernization efforts and so on. 
So one of the questions we ask is how are you, how is that modernization taking place? And uh, the way to interpret this is we've asked them uh, questions over the years. And what's really interesting here is a couple of things. First of all, when we ask people, like the proportion of people who say that they are modernizing their application by doing a lift and shift to cloud is actually relatively small, right? What we see happening much more, uh, uh, much more prevalent is two things. One hand, there's a significant proportion of people who say we are modernizing in place. We are, we are re-architecting often with cloud native technology concepts, but we're keeping it on on premises, right? And then others are saying no, we are refactoring and shifting. We're taking that application, refactoring and, and shipping it off to cloud. What's interesting here is that this, of course, is, is a high level survey data. Sometimes it will vary by organization within organization. Some product, some product lines may, be, may go one direction, other, product, or, or other types of workloads may, may stay the other. But the key point here is we're seeing this, it's not the, hey, we're staying on premises. It's not the, there is a mad journey to the cloud. That being said, there is a journey to the cloud. And what does that journey to the cloud look like? Well, we, uh, many people have uh, have referred to uh, multi-cloud as a thing. Is multi-cloud a thing? Uh, yes, multi-cloud is a thing. And what we're seeing here is uh, we ask practitioners what are uh, or how many cloud providers they use. And this is the focus of infrastructure as a service primarily. As you can see in the, in the survey data, the number of respondents will indicate that they have two or more is actually on aggregate approximately 75%. There is one interesting dynamic I like to call out here, which is multi-cloud is usually a, an emergent property of an organization. It's not something that within each individual project, you are going to, uh, to choose a multi-cloud approach. If you have one, if your application is going to run simultaneously on provider one and provider two, but it's much more along the lines of within the organization, one line of business may choose one uh, cloud provider for something, another line of business is going to choose another. This is relevant because security teams are usually more centralized and by being more centralized, they end up, their reality is much more present and multi is much more multi-cloud than the reality of what we see the um, than the reality of, of each individual project. So cloud security or multi-cloud as an emergent property of, uh, of an organization. So these are, so what I want to take you from this section is first of all, we are, these modernization efforts are going all the time and we are seeing a, uh, this combination of, hey, we're doing this on premises and we're doing this on cloud very common we are seeing adoption of cloud native technologies that's an important thing uh, the other thing is people are choosing where to best execute them we don't have time to go over too much detail but there's different nuances about how people choose why why they choose on cloud versus why they choose on premises and that as i mentioned earlier security teams centralized teams security being one are heavily affected by uh, the, the need to support these multiple environments. And you have to maintain uh, whether it's remote access, whether it's monitoring, whether it's configuration, compliance, et cetera, you end up having to support multiple environments. L tying to the topic of, uh, of, of our webinar here, uh, we, it's, it's really interesting because if you can simplify access to these environments, I think the, uh, which is one of the premises behind zero trust, I think it's a, uh, it's a key aspect to consider on, um, on some of these topics. And um, Tarun, uh, you had some content you wanted to talk about this as well. I, I, I assume that you see something very similar in, uh, uh, in your environments. Can you, can you walk us through some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Fernando. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tarun Desikin. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO at Banyan Security. Um, we are a provider of zero trust remote access solutions, specifically for data center and multi-cloud environments. So um, I'm going to walk through a customer scenario that highlights some of the points that Fernando just covered. Uh, many, many, many companies are performing this migration, moving away from traditional environments to modern uh, infrastructure as a service environments. 
And this customer, it's a Banyan customer, it's a large Fortune 500 technology company with a global workforce. Uh, you know, employees that are distributed around different countries, thousands and thousands of users and devices, and large software engineering teams, large DevOps teams, uh, significant investments in both infrastructure and software development tooling. And what we found was that as they started their migration to a hybrid and multi-cloud future, uh, they were moving away from kind of, they were moving thousands and thousands of applications, and they were moving away from a traditional VMware-based data center environment to a more hybrid environment that spanned not just VMware, but also AWS and Azure. And one of the key challenges uh, companies face as they migrate into these data center and multi-cloud scenarios is a, actually ends up being a productivity challenge. So when you have a global workforce, uh, we used to have scenarios where the VPN concentrators were based in the US, and you have your workers in, say, Germany accessing cloud infrastructure that is now, say, in AWS in, in the EU. And they would have to trombone all the way across the Atlantic into the concentrator in the US and then back out. And so these various traditional network backhauling architectures ended up slowing cloud access significantly. And secondly, a lot of the traditional security mechanisms were based on IP whitelisting. And anyone who's in the DevOps realm knows that IP whitelisting is very hard to manage, is very slow to actually operationalize, and that was also hampering productivity. So productivity becomes really key as these migrations go forward and as DevOps teams start using cloud environments. The second part of the challenge customers face in these environments is, is the concept of multi-cloud that Fernando said. It, it wasn't just one cloud they were migrating to, they were migrating to multiple clouds. And not only that, developers were just using their credit cards to spin up new accounts, to try stuff. The business was encouraging them to move quickly, so they were spinning up new services all the time. But the challenge with that is now you have many different accounts instantiated differently. With uh, Each cloud has slightly different network security concepts. It becomes a real security nightmare. So as you think about zero trust and as you think about simplifying access to multi-cloud environments, it, it's kind of really important to recognize, you know, as in the Wizard of Oz, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. The, the world has changed. Um, we have to keep in mind automation for DevOps teams. So tools like Terraform and CloudFormation and Python SDK has become really core requirement to enabling zero trust access. Um, you need like capabilities in your zero trust platform to auto discover resources and provide catalog of, hey, these are the services that are running in these environments for easy use. And finally, of course, policies, security policies need to be enforced. And you can't do that on IP addresses anymore. In these multi-cloud environments, you have to based on user and device trust, essentially. So those are some of the learnings uh, we have encountered in the field. Uh, working with large customers. And I'm curious, Fernando, if you have seen similar concepts in your interviews as well. Yeah, no, we uh, we definitely see the complexity of uh, distributing that access across multiple environments. Uh, it becomes an issue uh, because in many, in many of the conversations we have, people are indicating just how long those uh, those digital transformation projects may be, and you end up even if you if you think you're completely migrating to one environment, you end up with this hybrid, uh, temporary right. environment for a very very long time, right? And uh, in some cases, uh, forever. Like in some some sometimes even with the even with the, the the cloud infrastructure is still backhauling some internal traffic back, and 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 you have to address that as well, right? So, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, we we right there with you in terms of uh, in terms of seeing many of many of those uh, the, those same things. I wanted to move us to a, to a different point. So we talked about the high level architecture. Let's talk a little bit about DevOps trends uh, themselves, right? So we uh, yes, multi cloud, on premises, hybrid environments, what have you. What's happening on multi cloud on on DevOps? And, and this is a very interesting data point because it il illuminates some of those changes, right? Here, we asked DevOps practitioners. We were not talking about specifically about, um, we were not talking specifically about 
security or IT, we're talking DevOps practitioners, and we ask them, uh, where are you executing your DevOps projects for some definition of DevOps? Where are you executing them now? And where do you expect them to be executing in two years? So this data is from 2021, so it's relatively fresh, right? And you can see here that the majority, or I shouldn't say the majority, but the, the, there's a high proportion of people who indicate that they were doing a private cloud on-premises. Remember those uh, those uh, modernized on-premises I was talking about? Well, here it is, right? So some people are doing that on-premises and they're modernizing on-premises. Uh, well, they're deploying DevOps on-premises. And so you can see that 23%, for example, indicate that they're doing this now, but when we ask them, where do you expect to be in, in, in two years, right, the, the more, most significant uh, venues for execution, that number drops to 15%. Right. When we ask people about on-premises non-cloud, you see dropping from 19 to nine. Comparatively, we see people uh, uh, indicating significant growth in IaaS and PaaS, 14% um, uh, now up to 22% in, in the future. Now there's always an element of people are, are a little more optimistic in their deployments, but we like to see trends. There's a, there's a there's a famous quote by a statistician that I like, George Box. He says that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Like I use that that line all the time. It's not, <laughs> the it's the not act of model. modeling is useful. What, what's that? The act yeah. of modeling is very useful as well. Yes, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. The, the the plan may be worthless, but the planning is essential, right? right. And um, but uh, in, in this case here, we're seeing this shift towards public. Right, uh, uh, which I think is, is something for you to keep in mind as you're going through that, your own processes. Moving on, okay, so what technologies are you deploying? And this um, this slide looks a little bit uh, a little bit busy. I'll walk you through it very briefly. What we, what we did here is we asked practitioners, we asked specifically we asked specialists. We didn't ask, we, we didn't ask just senior IT management, we asked more uh, technical staff who is more involved hands-on with these technologies, so who have a better sense of where they are in terms of implementation. We asked them about containers, Kubernetes, serverless technologies, and service meshes. And uh, you can see the data. So for example, in 2019, 23% of uh, respondents indicated full adoption of containers, uh, with, uh, tw sorry, with 23% indicating some adoption. That combination grew to nearly 70% in 2021. What I wanted to call out on this chart is that, that, that I think that the main visual point of this chart is that specifically when it comes to technology adoption, we definitely see container adoption kind of leading Kubernetes, serverless and service mesh. And there's a lot of new ones we can go into. What are they using serverless for? What are we using containers for? And so on. But the general point I want you to take from this is that container technology is one of the main, uh, is the one that's further ahead, if you will, in terms of, uh, of uh, perception of deployment uh, out in the field. So that's, uh, that's one point. So when we are talking about our containers, we also asked people, where are they executing those containers? And it's really interesting, uh, the, the, the blue data point is a multi-select, but, the, but the, the, the yellow one is more of a, uh, the yellow one is more, uh, it, it's a single select, so you have to choose, right? So it's still interesting to see that 43% of people, for example, indicate that they are still primarily running those containers in private cloud. Right now, just to, just to, to to move on to one topic uh, to, to to wrap up this section with one topic on on DevOps technology, if you will, we have uh, an interesting uh, data point, which is we ask practitioners where are they executing their Kubernetes environments, right? And uh, the, the way to to read this is that seventy one percent of respondents indicate that they use Kubernetes on public cloud. 58% of respondents indicate they use a commercial version of distribution. Those would be the likes of OpenShift or VMware Tenzu or Rancher or different uh, distributions, right? Whereas only 33% indicate that they run straight up vanilla uh, Kubernetes. And which leads us to conclude that, um, which leads us to conclude that at least from, from the data we've seen, 
managing some of this infrastructure, at least from this develop from this practitioners, they are looking at it almost more. Um, they are looking at it as a, as toil, right? More than they see. And toil is a is a is a word that's often used in the context of DevOps. You want to reduce toil, right? So uh, they are, it seems that. There is this perception of, hey, listen, I'm going to be running this on the public cloud. I'm going to be running this. If, if, if I am running this not on the public cloud service, I am going to, to, to use a, uh, a commercial distribution. The, the only slight uh, nuance I wanted to add here is when we break it down by larger companies versus smaller companies, by employee size, smaller companies uh, uh, tend to give a slightly more, uh, slightly more of an edge for um, for free open source, it's it's within the margin of error, right? Uh, they also seem to indicate that they understand that it, they are seeing as toil and the 64% on uh, on uh, the commercial distribution is, is interesting as well. Now, just to wrap up the couple of key points on that on this session, we talk, I've shown you data, we've shown data that DevOps environments will be diverse. We've seen data that uh, there is broad adoption of container technology specifically but with others coming up right behind it. Kubernetes environments, uh, we saw that there's different execution venues for those, and those are very popular. And, and uh, But again, one of the things we talk about is we often see customers are not necessarily deploying small number of very large Kubernetes clusters. People seem to be favoring lots of smaller Kubernetes clusters, it's almost as if from a security perspective, the trust boundary is the Kubernetes cluster, not so much a namespace, which means that you're going to have multiple little clusters. And uh, as in line with the topic for this for this session, uh, how do you do remote access to those multiple different environments becomes an issue. Right? Now, right. Uh, as Tarun and I were, 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 were discussing, there is some interesting data that they have on the, uh, on the, uh, on, adopting uh, remote access to DevOps use cases. Uh, Tarun, you want to take over? Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing in your section, Fernando, which is the cloud providers are playing a very important part in pushing Kubernetes environments. So specifically Google, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, Azure Cloud, they've yep. made it really easy to consume Kubernetes. And I think that's why you're seeing people spinning up many, many Kubernetes clusters, because it's so easy. You just click a button, you get a Kubernetes cluster, as opposed to creating namespaces within a Kubernetes cluster. Yep, yep, I, I agree. That the, the, the challenge we see for people is that sometimes they turn on those Kubernetes clusters and they forgot to turn them off, uh, and there's right. a nasty deal at the end. But that's a different that, that's a different conversation. Yes, and uh, so just parlaying on that, you know, we see this trend um, not just from provisioning Kubernetes clusters, but also securing these cloud native and Kubernetes environments. So um, in this customer vignette, you know, we have, this is a, a public real estate company. So it's a technology company. They have fast growing, fast moving DevOps teams that are serving thousands of developers, you know, many, many, many teams. And they are what you call a cloud first company. So unlike the previous vignette, which was more a traditional company that was kind of migrating to the cloud, this company just grew up in the cloud. Uh, specifically, they grew up in Amazon Web Services. And because they grew up in the cloud, they're used to moving very, very, very fast. Um, so we're talking about not just developers with a credit card spinning up uh, instance, but developers with a credit card spinning up an instance and seeking it and putting it into production all the way through. But one of the things that happens when you move so fast is that sometimes you take on some bad practices as well. So for example, you know, many times S3 buckets would be placed on the internet. Uh, many times that developer project that went to production, the developer quits and nobody knows how it's actually set up. So one of the biggest challenges in these kind of cloud native and Kubernetes environments from a zero trust perspective is to create a security baseline. What is out there? Who is accessing those resources? Uh, which of them are high risk? Which of them are placed on the internet? So that becomes a genuine challenge in cloud native and Kubernetes setups. The second part of, of the challenge is by definition DevOps in cloud native is actually an ecosystem story. So Kubernetes is just one tool, but around Kubernetes, there's a whole ecosystem of, of a lot of productivity software that makes Kubernetes so powerful. So for example, you might use Helm chart to manage your applications. You might use GitHub and GitLab to set up 
CICD processes. Uh, you might use a tool like Lens to give a, a graphical interface into your clusters. Um, so all of these tools in the ecosystem require integrations. And then what happens is the traditional network-based approaches, which is let's open up IP addresses, let's uh, whitelist, let's peer to networks, they just don't work. You have too many clusters and too ephemeral a setup for that to be really scalable. So what you need instead is more of what we, have, what we propose is a zero trust approach. And uh, tooling today, and it's not just Banyan, other, other, other vendors are also capable of similar tooling, they have native support for these cloud native and Kubernetes environments. So native support for Kubernetes API access, native support for SSH access, and so on. And not only that, that native support is coupled with a great developer DevOps user experience. So they can access their clusters, just the clusters that they have least privileged access to with a single click. So you can, you can use modern techniques such as API keys and short loop credentials instead of relying on your traditional VPN IP whitelisting systems. And so that's one way we see customers who are adopting cloud native and Kubernetes also using a zero trust security posture. Yeah, and uh, I would add that at least from, from conversations we have, I'm not sure if you're seeing similar, a lot of the times the, the, the concerns that people have about securing these environments is that it, the flaw is that something was left exposed and that's not something you readily make available via an IP whitelist, right? It's not it's not clearly visible there, right? And um, so yes, it's um, narrowing how we're going to access these, these, uh, these resources is really interesting. Right? Anyway, so just to, uh, uh, Tarun and I can talk about this for days if need be, right? So uh, I wanted to move us on, so we talked about cloud technologies, we talked about DevOps technologies. I wanted to touch a little bit on security, right? I mean, DevOps security specifically. And the point that I wanted to, to raise is, first of all, we conduct surveys uh, with, this particular survey was with DevOps practitioners, right? So it was a, um, it was more of a, of a uh, uh, in general, how are you deploying DevOps in your organization? And one of the really interesting things here is we asked them, is we gave them options. And as you can see from the slide, these developers, these program managers, they are, when you ask them what's important for you, security is coming as the number one topic. Now, uh, uh, those with the background in the statistics, we may quibble about whether that's within the margin of error and I'll grant you, grant you that, but uh, it's it's undeniable that there is a there is an understanding from those DevOps practitioners that security is important. That security can be a key that, that that security is a key objective for that DevOps initiative, right? So that that's looking at it from the from the from the beginning, right? That they want to achieve security as part of their DevOps efforts. Are they getting there? The answer is no, or at least not quite. When we ask people what are the biggest hurdles for your uh, for your adoption of cloud native technology, now here we are asking people: you are going on, you are implementing your uh, you're implementing your processes, and you're having issues. What is the most uh, what's what's the common roadblock? Right, and and uh, you can see security there at 54 percent. That's the highest. Um, uh, that's the highest I've seen so far. In, in, and we do keep longitudinal data on this, and it's well outside the margin of error, right? So security here is absolutely acknowledged as a major concern. Wait, aren't, aren't we supposed to be uh, collaborating on this? Isn't this the point of, of DevSecOps and so on and so forth? Yes, uh, um, yes it is, but are we doing that right? The answer is not quite, All right? And um, the data that we have here, again, we're asking DevOps practitioners, and is, okay, how do the security teams and the DevOps teams collaborate to achieve your DevSecOps objectives? And approximately 43% of respondents indicate that, yes, the security team and the DevOps teams closely collaborate to integrate DevSecOps requirements. Great. 
um, I can argue that 57% say they don't actively collaborate, and that's a problem to be solved. Uh, you can see the you can see the numbers here, but what I found particularly interesting is that when you ask, uh, and and the answers go down, uh, uh, you, you can see here, but then we take that same that same question and we and we fraction it and and we uh, we split it by this respondent level, uh, who responded to that survey, and a couple of very interesting data points or the things they pop up. One of them is that those who indicate that they are senior managers, right, those who self-identify as senior managers, indicate this level of cooperation at 49%, well above the 43, right? What's going on here, right? And on the flip side, those who indicate that they are staff or management, when, they, when you ask them about that FECOPs, they primarily indicate that it's a responsibility for the quote-unquote DevOps team. And we, we, we don't need to get into the discussion of is DevOps a team versus a practice. Let, let's not go there. But what we are seeing here is that there is a disconnect between what senior managers think is happening and what is actually, or and, and what the team at the, the, the implementing it thinks is happening. And that's, and that's a potential problem, right? Now, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to, 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 to leave us just talking about uh, negative. I think that there are very positive things happening. One of them is this. Now, the way to interpret this chart, and I'll walk you through it just briefly, is security. We ask practitioners what percentage of your DevOps workloads include, some, include security. Right? And then uh, you can see at the bottom here, uh, less than 10%, 10, 20, 30, 40, all, all the way up to 100%. And what you're seeing here highlighted, this curve, this dark blue curve, uh, is almost an approximation of a, of a distribution curve, almost, right? In that back in 2019, when we asked this question, you can see there's a very big bump towards the 10 to 30% range, right? When you ask the same question in 2020, that big bump is now closer, is now in the 50 to 70 range. And when you ask that question, we asked this question in early 2021, that same uh, big bump is now a little, it, it, it's a little bit smaller, right? But it's now shifting towards that 70 to 80%. I'm looking at this from a positive perspective that people acknowledge that they have to deploy more security on their processes and they are working to do so. Right. Why, why I think this is important is at least security practitioners have often uh, had to deal with the, with the perception that, oh, no, developers don't care about security. No, they do. Right. And, and here is living proof that they are adding more security controls to the processes that they are developing. This is a good thing. Now, not just so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves, the, the other data point I wanted to share on this section is they do want to own security, but they don't want to own all of security or, or all of networking, right? It's not about dumping, uh, it's not about just shifting left to developers and not worrying about it yourself as an operations or security team. When we ask them, what kind of functions do they think that, uh, that, uh, that DevOps practitioners think that the network team should own and manage, they do, 52% of them indicate that the security part is really something that they that they are expecting the network team to handle. Again, inside the margin of error for, for a couple of these other areas, but I thought it was interesting that it came as a top choice. So just to um, just to summarize what we saw on, on this section, right? security was listed as a number one topic of concern, both from a tactical perspective in terms of Hey, it's what's blocking us, but also as a strategic one, it's our top, it's our top strategic objective for the the top strategic strategic objective for our DevOps initiative. Then we also see that there is evidence of gaps into um, into how security and DevOps teams are talking together, and. That, in our experience, that's a potential problem because you may expect that a level of support is going to be there for something you need, and hey, we already have it. Oh, no, 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 we don't. Right? That's always a, a stressful conversation to be had. And then that developers want to, are, are okay to own 
some of the security elements, but not all of them. And, and I'm pointing here that they don't want to be bothered with uh, simplifying, or, or sorry, they don't want to be bothered with solving the remote access. They don't want to be bothered with uh, try having to connect to unwieldy uh, approaches so they can get their work done. Right? And again, in the context of this conversation, a zero trust, um, a zero trust discussion is something that uh, that I think it's uh, it's absolutely worth having. Tarun, sorry, I've uh, I've, I've pontificated on 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 this long enough. Right, and, um, um, but may, maybe maybe before I jump in, uh, what do you see as some of the biggest complaints in terms of securing DevOps? Like just answer one of the audience Q and A before I take over. Well, I think that one of the biggest things that I that I um, that we hear in terms of complaints, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote, uh, I, I remember vividly when, when, when we still could meet in person, I led uh, a conversation with a round of developers, uh, DevOps practitioners about about that topic, security, right? How do we handle, what's, what's wrong, or, or how do we get security working better together? And one developer uh, for a very large organization, they raised their hand and they said, I don't even know who my security people are. Security is a is an email alias that I send stuff to, and stuff just goes right. there, and I don't know what happens after. So that uh, I think that they would definitely fall on that fifty seven percent that uh, that that I showed earlier. So I think there's a yeah. lot of opportunity here for for teams to work better together, and simplifying quote unquote the toil, right? I mean, what what's the stuff that can be easily resolved for them to work together? So I think that that would like be a, yeah. The, the most common complaint we hear is that security slows the DevOps people down. Is that you right. know if you didn't have us do these five or six things, the product would be live, uh, the business would be making money. Um, you know we would have many benefits if if you just didn't slow us down, and that ends up uh, being one of the hardest things for security teams to to. to to, to counter, right? how can how can you put security in place without slowing the teams around you down? And and uh, I agree. Here's where I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll push back a little bit on some of the conversations. So we, we talk to DevOps and to security, right? One of the one of the the, the the pushbacks we hear is that yes, we want to put security, but it's too slow in some cases. It's it's too unwieldy. On the flip side is when something bad happens, like if, if you don't have some level of accountability back to the developers, not just for the quality of the code that you write, but actually for the security of their environment, then it's a free for all, and that doesn't, and and that's right. not viable either, right? So there is there is this 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 back and forth. We have to, uh, it's it's a fantastic topic, right? But we we have to to um, to bring these teams working together in terms of, give me the technology that I need to do that I need to do my job faster. But at the same time, I understand that I have responsibilities that I have to, to follow. And again, we saw on the on the survey data, people want to do that, right? It, it, I, if there is one message I, I, I see on a lot of these surveys that I, I want to get to, 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 to our audience is, I think that the time when developers didn't care is long gone. Right, but that doesn't mean right. that you can just dump, dump stuff on them and 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 that's the end of it. Right, right. and and that segues nicely into what I want to talk about, which is sure. the right way to bring zero trust into DevOps is to bake the processes in. Is to just you know DevOps teams think in terms of of automation. Uh, they think in terms of infrastructure as code. So the best way to get zero trust security is to make your zero trust security processes automated. Your policy should be automated, your service creation, your deployment, your monitoring. Um, if you expect DevOps teams to manually bring up gateways, file tickets for IP whitelisting, you know, this is going to work around your system. So security needs to buy into the whole concept of automation. Security needs to buy into the fact that policies should be code. A policy should not be implemented as ad hoc spot checks. I will write a big long document on how to do security, and then every six months or so, when the compliance guy comes around, I'll come and check and see if you followed it. But I can guarantee you the DevOps guy has not followed it. <laughs> um, the the other, other, other capability when you think about zero trust security, especially as it pertains to DevOps workflows, is 
we have to give up on IT whitelisting. I feel like if I had a personal battle to fight in security, it would be against IT whitelisting. In, I, I've been a network engineer for 20 years. I have done IT whitelisting all my career, but if there's a time to stop, it is now. Uh, we have so many better tools, you know, rotate your API keys, use cryptographic credentials, certificates. There are so many better ways to bake in security. And fundamentally, IP whitelisting is the antithesis of DevOps. Um, the other recommendation, we see this in a lot of companies, is DevOps teams and even security teams sometimes try to roll their own software. But it's much better to use a centralized identity system, either provided by your cloud provider or your single sign-on provider, than to roll your own. And the, the other part I would say is um, sometimes we see security teams really enforcing rigid corporate standards. And that never flies. Uh, developer experience is probably the number one requirement for any security program in the DevOps. And if your goal is to get your DevOps professionals baking security into your system, you have to prioritize their productivity. And these are kind of hard fought lessons. Some of them might be obvious, but uh, I do feel, you know, I feel strongly that these are the do's. Yeah, and and uh, it, it aligns with let's make let, and, and, and well, I'll, I'll get to key learnings in a second, but it aligns well with, hey, listen, this is what, this is how we get these teams to work better together. People are not going to just accept, hey, I, they are not going to accept roadblocks just on, just as a moral imperative, right? right? And, um, 100%, right. 100%. So with that in mind, um, let me just, um, just go ahead a little bit on what it is that that we're seeing moving ahead, and and I think that some from some of the commentary we've had so far, you can kind of sense uh, you can kind of sense where we're going. I um, uh, one of the things I like to do, I always like to I I, uh, I think often about martial arts. If you're looking at my background, I, I practice martial arts. There's my martial arts belts in the back there. So apologies for that. We have in in in, in martial arts there's a saying: you don't you, know, you, you sweat in the in, in the gym uh, so you don't bleed in in battle or in the ring. And so I think that the notion of practicing and improving comes all the time. So I apologize for the karate images, but uh, it's it's near and dear to me. I think that we need to have as a um, as an industry, right? I think we need to have this this deep and broad understanding of what the technology we are working with is right and that's one of, and that's a big challenge for for security teams we we have to understand at a high level what's going on around the world and uh, whether that's a business requirement or whether it's a technical requirement can i use a new technology to do something how secure is that technology how or how do i implement secu uh, my security objectives on that technology that's not an easy job right so you want to minimize the the, the 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 drudgery of the stuff that you know how to do and you can automate so you can dedicate yourself to understanding these, these broader topics at the same time you have to accept that the teams are going to expect technology that lets them do their job i think that the, the tarun mentioned the, the 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 large pdf absolutely right we, we can't do that right we have to find a way that i don't want 500 vulnerabilities listed on a PDF report. I want them as tickets on my CI/CD pipeline, right? That I, that I can that I can work from. Right? We have to find ways of. Uh, I think that we have to find ways of addressing this inherent complexity of everything. So, again, to minimize these obstacles to collaboration, and in the context of this conversation, uh, uh, we haven't brought up. Uh, we're, we're all living through uh, the, the, the pandemic. We're all living through is rethinking of how people connect to different things, right? Uh, this is a time where we are rethinking how we give access to things, right? And uh, uh, as, as I say on the on the thing there, I think we have to be ready to accept that zero trust has a very, very, very interesting uh, role to play in, um, in all of this. Now, uh, Tarun, before I, I, I pass over to you, uh, Anything else you would like to add from a, from a broader learning perspective kind of thing? I, I, I agree completely. Uh, we didn't talk much about COVID and the pandemic, but it has really driven a lot of new requirements. And yep. honestly, every company we talk to, uh, even when they're adopting DevOps, has also realized that they need to think about uh, remote access. And oftentimes, the requirement for remote access drives requirements for DevOps as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the, yep. the one thing I would say is, and you don't need to wait 
oftentimes, you know, when we talk to customers or prospects, they say, hey, let the DevOps guys go run a little bit ahead. It's a new project for us. Let's wait for six months. And that reminds me of my one of my favorite sayings, Fernando, which is uh, the best time to plant a tree was yes. 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah. So yeah. you shouldn't wait. Don't, don't, you don't need to wait for DevOps to be up and kicking in your environment. You can get started today. You can try it small. And um, Banyan, we actually have a free product, which is you know, limited by number of users, but pretty much unlimited in terms of capability. It allows you to evaluate and plug your security holes. It also provides your, you can verify that your developers will actually enjoy using the tool. It's very easy to get started. And best of all, for DevOps teams, it doesn't cost anything. And so I would really encourage uh, viewers to go try adding zero trust to your DevOps environments. It, it isn't that hard, and it actually will add a lot of value to your business, and not just today, but also going forward. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so with that in mind, I think that uh, we're now ready to take some, some, some questions. I think that uh, uh, as you and I have been talking, like the, I know there have been questions popping up on, on the chat. I'll uh, either uh, you or, 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 or John or someone else to help us uh, feel through some of those. Um, I, sure. I, I, I can uh, do. I, I see can one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Mike, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, yeah. The, so I just want to mention that. Uh, uh, just a quick reminder for the audience, uh, simply type in the question on the box on your screen if you have any. We already have some. So I'll begin with the first one. The first question that I see is my organization has invested in various privileged access management tools, including Bastion hosts and audit lodges. Can I just simply, can I just implement zero trust using those or do I, do I have to purchase new tools? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think um, yeah, it's more for Taru, for you, Taru. I'm sorry. Yeah, so you know, privilege access management is a is a is a, I would say it has been a, a traditional field. It has been there for many years. There are many large players in this field, and what has happened with the move to DevOps is PAM, the privilege access management. There's been a convergence of what PAM provides and what your traditional VPN provides, and this has happened because. Traditionally, your VPN gave you access to your network, and your privilege access management tool gave you access to your services within that network, like a SSH bastion or an SSH audit logger. Um, when you move to, to AWS or Azure or GCP, these are by definition running in the cloud somewhere else. So you don't need to have two separate tools to accomplish the same functionality. You can just have one tool that gives you both the network access as well as the SSH logging and the bastion capability. So uh, you don't need to buy a new tool, but there is a whole class of tools that are in the market that actually combine both functionalities. And so when you think about your existing PAM solutions, they can be layered on to a new zero trust solution, or in some cases they can be entirely replaced. Perfect. Uh, the second question I see over here is, would deploying a zero trust solution be addition to our existing VPN or does it replace it? Um, Fernando, I, I can take the second half, but what are your thoughts? So I would say that, uh, I'll go back to the, the, to the karate analogies, right? And it, we're always improving, right? So um, I would say it really depends on project and, and uh, I would not, I, 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 I I would never make any specific recommendations without better understanding client environments. What I will say is that in many of the observations that we've seen is that you uh, you can potentially start with smaller projects that that complement that uh, that VPN in the sense of hey perhaps this this particular application or this particular business unit or or what have you uh, we are moving you we're moving you to this little by little. Uh, so that, yeah. that incremental aspect really really resonates with me. Uh, as to whether you're whether you're doing this to um, uh, like I, I think that doing this inside an existing connection doesn't make as much sense. But uh, but again, I would never make specific recommendations without understanding yeah. the environment first. 
Yeah, I, I agree. It is this question, it, the environment matters a lot. Um, for, just, just give you some specific examples. If you were completely in the cloud, if you were only in AWS, and the, you know it wasn't physically connected to your corporate network at all, then yes, you know you can make do without a VPN. However, if you have a large on-premise infrastructure, large data centers connected with you know SD WAN and MPLS tunnels, you cannot replace your VPN on day one. It just so you're better off picking a small project and enabling zero trust just for that environment. So it really depends, uh, and in most large enterprises, you definitely want to do zero trust in addition to your existing VPN. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. Uh, next question that came in is, how can a zero trust solution save time in the DevOps process? Well, I'll 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 take an early stab at it, and Tarun, please uh, chime in. Whenever you're the, if the moment that you, DevOps processes, we want to simplify access to environments, right? And the moment that you are not fighting over what's the IP whitelist that I have to have to allow something, or uh, perhaps I am, uh, I'll give you an example. Perhaps if you, if you have to have the, if you have to, to have a manual process or an administrative, a burdensome administrative process to get access to new resources that were spun up because of elasticity, right? I mean, uh, right. Uh, all of a sudden I needed five VMs. I had five VMs and now I need 500. If, if, if something that, uh, if, if your access process doesn't account for these kinds of things, it's going to delay access. It's going to be burdensome to your, to your team on, on the runtime, right? I would argue that one of the important things about DevOps as well, and we didn't cover too much the pipeline process, the process itself, is how well do you, um, there's multiple steps in the process before something gets released to production. You have to set up multiple different uh, environments. Perhaps you have to do uh, uh, load testing in one, you're doing QA testing in another. All of these environments are things where if you have to somehow debate with somebody, am I going to do, am I going to a jump server? Am I going to have to get a new VPN access? Or all of those things are, are things where there's opportunity for delay. And if we want to reduce the toil of, of, of remote access, something like Zero Trust, again, I think it's worth taking a good look at. Yeah, the, just to build on that, um, the, the, I think what Fernando is saying is there's a lot of friction that security could add to yeah. the DevOps process. And the answer is automation. So if you can automate security policy, it will automatically reduce the friction. And specifically, friction points we see is in onboarding and offboarding. Onboarding and offboarding either new services or onboarding and offboarding new users. And both of those today should be automated because your new services, especially in DevOps environments, are spun up with Terraform and CloudFormation and automation tools. And similarly, your new users are typically in a nice identity provider like Azure AD or Okta. There is no reason to like stitch together, you know, special code to make that happen. You should just be able to connect the two APIs together and grant access based on the privileges and the type of service it is. And so, uh, I'm a big fan of automation. I hope that came out, and I genuinely believe automation mm -hmm. will save time uh, if we can get security into that mindset. 100. percent Anything else, Malik or John? Maybe one question, uh, Fernando, we can cover. It's a good one because the cloud provider offers a lot of security tools. Why can't I just use those? Uh, I smirk I, I because it, 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 it's a legitimate concern. And I'll point it back to what I talked about earlier on, very, very early on. Perhaps you as a developer, you have visibility of or, or, or a developer within a project, you may have visibility of something specific to, to your environment. Whereas uh, a more centralized team that has to solve multiple things needs that that multi-cloud support. And in many cases, I, I I give credit to the to the cloud providers, but they are focused almost by definition on their on their environment. So. In many cases, it's the, you want the flexibility of having of using the same kind of uh, of capability to connect across multiple environments, and that's where cloud providers a little sometimes have to uh, 
the technology yeah. that they offer is is uh, uh, is somewhat by the again by definition much more uh, applicable to their own environments than others. The the, the other aspect I, I I would say is when you look at security itself, um, cloud providers will will not just get you into their environment. They will focus on authenticating you with their system. But when you look at an enterprise, oftentimes user identity is stored in a single sign-on solution. Device identity is stored in a device management solution. Device posture is stored in an EDR solution. There are many solutions, cloud solutions, that are not actually connected to your infrastructure provider. And mm -hmm. it's very, very rare that an infrastructure provider goes and gets signals from those to give you access. When from an enterprise security posture, you want to say, Fernando on a on a valid, good posture device can access resources. Fernando on a compromised device should not access resources. So those kind of simple security policies are typically not in the mandate of what cloud providers provide. And, mm -hmm. and this is why companies have traditionally used the VPN, because the VPN allows them to enforce these kinds of policies. Um, and so even though the cloud providers offer a lot of security tools and you should use all the security tools, uh, you typically need a different layer, a more centrally managed layer to coordinate all the different systems to enforce a enterprise security policy. Uh, it's spoken much better than I did. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have another question. Uh, so this one is, how would the presence of a zero trust access solution affect the developer's daily UX? I'll defer um, that to you. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And, and just, just in all honesty, you know, the easiest solution, the easiest security solution is just to be on the network. And you're on the network, you really don't um, need to know about what you're accessing and you just get access to everything. Now, unfortunately, if you're on the network, you also have very little security controls about where you go in the network. And so every zero trust access solution needs to provide both security, but without affecting the developer's daily use experience. So it is a challenge uh, we have. And then what I would suggest is every uh, viewer who has this question should go try the different products. Most products, well, most products should, have a free option that you can just go try. And so Banyan has the team edition you can go try, some other vendors have. And you can you have to judge for yourself whether your developer's experience changes. I can tell you from our side, we spend a lot of time making sure our developer user experience is seamless and actually fun. And we try to make it actually easy and, and programmable and provide CLI so people can you know further enhance and customize their workflows. Um, but, but you know, everyone has a different requirement. People have different opinions. So I, I would say people are trying hard, but I don't think this is a solved problem yet. But we, we definitely aspire to make a zero-trust solution transparent and even fun for a developer. Absolutely. Thanks, Tarun. Uh, that concludes our roundtable for today. We'll make sure to address all unanswered questions via an email after the live event concludes. Thank you, Fernando and Tarun. As a reminder, the on-demand version of this event will be available shortly on behalf of Bunyan Security and 451 Research. Thank you for attending and have a great day. Thank you all. Everybody have a great day. Ciao. Thank you.